us through how and why goal setting matters. We have Sue Delatti, distinguished Toastmaster and past international director. Sue, take it away. Thanks, Craig. I am very excited about this webinar. I have been looking forward to this webinar for a long time. I love goals. I love goal setting. I can't imagine my life without goals. I know I'm a bit of a fanatic about that. I, and Toastmasters helps me in that regard. We have so many goals that we're able to have, whether our personal goals or those at the district that I get my fix as a junkie that needs goals. However, I do want to confess that not every goal that I've had has been accomplished. I have had some challenges along the ways and I've come to the conclusion that I have some ideas on how come. Perhaps it was the goal setting process that I used that didn't work or maybe it was just why I wanted that goal in the first place. What I wanted to do tonight was to share with you some of those lessons that I've had so that perhaps you with your goals will be able to live them and see them and really be encouraged by them and not run into challenges like I did. Now for some, it's a no brainer that we need goals. And I'm not here to convince you that you should have goals in your life. You have goals, whether you realize it or not. We all have projects, activities, things we need to do. We need to be able to measure whether we in fact met those goals. Most of us know how to set plans. We all realize that it takes action to do it. We all have very busy schedules and we need to put these into our schedule in terms of activities. That's not the purpose of this particular workshop. For those of you who are wondering whether you should have goals or not, that would be for another day. Each one of you has probably also heard about SMART goals. Every single training seminar that I've gone to, inevitably, somebody comes up with, you need to have SMART goals. And the acronym for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, timely, is something that the trainers at the front of the room get us to repeat. Intellectually, we understand what it means to create SMART goals. As a matter of fact, when we were at our training last August in Chicago for the TRIO, when we were setting up our district goals, out they carted the SMART goals and we dutifully created goals using the five acronyms. Intellectually, I get it. I understand if I want to accomplish something, it's got to be specific. I understand the measurable. Of course, I want to attain it. It has to be relevant to me. Otherwise, I'm not going to do it. And if it isn't timely, I won't know that it's actually accomplished when it's done. But here's, here's my question to each one of you. Why then? If I follow the same process, why do I accomplish some of my goals and I don't accomplish my other ones? I've had this conversation with friends. Some of them say, Sue, you're just not motivated enough. You really didn't want to achieve that goal as much as you thought. You need to visualize. You need to find some motivation deep down and then and only then you'll be able to go back to your plan and put in the SMART goals and accomplish it. Hmm. Right, I think I'm a pretty motivated person. I'm really, I'm not sure about that. Others have reminded me on many occasions. I mentioned this at our deck meeting in early January. 
You can have good intentions for doing something, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to result in great performance. I get that as well. But if I have good intentions, why am I not able to accomplish what it is I want to do? And they say, maybe it's your plan. Maybe the plan isn't done well. Maybe you need to relook at the plan. You know, it occurred to me that if it's about whether I'm motivated or not motivated, whether I have good intentions to do it or not, whether I have a great plan or not, sometimes still I don't achieve my goals. And it occurred to me. Many times in goals that I have, whether it's at work, whether it's in Toastmasters, whether it's here at home, I have a number of options to take. On any given day, I have things that I like to do and things that I can't stand doing. Well, let me ask you this. Which ones do you think I'm going to do first? Naturally, I'm going to go to the ones that I love doing. And if any of my goals have activities or steps that I can't stand doing, I'm human. I'm not going to do them. It's no, it's no challenge to understand why wasn't I able to accomplish that goal if I don't want to do the things I don't want to do. But sometimes we have to do the things we want to do. So what do we do then? Well, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Try something different. Rather than simply looking at creating a plan, coming up with smart goals, dig deep down and look at yourself and ask yourself, why am I trying to fight that person who needs to be rewarded, that person that needs immediate gratification, otherwise I'm not going to do something, that person that I tried something, it didn't work, and I don't like doing it again. Why don't I embrace who I am and see if I can use what I am and what my natural tendencies are to deliver and meet the goals that I have. Sometimes it's going to work with a plan and those SMART goals, but if you're anything like me, sometimes it's not. So here's some of the options I have for you. I mentioned that there are certain things that I hate to do. I am very goals oriented, I'll admit it. I love it. However, when I am working with goals with someone else on our team, I have to follow up with the team members. I can't stand following up with people. I admit it. It sounds funny as a district director, you must be thinking, well, gosh, she has to follow up with people all the time. Mm-hmm, I do, and I can't stand it. Now, here I am ranting away, talking about a secret inside of me that I don't like following up with people. Frankly, I figure people have their activities, they should go and do it. Here's the interesting thing about ranting about what it is we don't like to do. Once you shared that with someone else, it's almost like you've been liberated. Now it's not a secret anymore. You know I don't like following up with people. Now I can step back and say, I know I have to follow up with people. I don't like doing it. They're going to know I don't like doing it. Maybe we can come to a meeting of the minds. I don't like doing it. You don't like me to do it. Is there any way we might make this work? Whenever we hate something or we really don't like to do it, if we start seeing that it's crucial or needed 
in order for us to get to the end of where we want to go, why don't we just do it anyway? I don't know about you, but my day is not necessarily filled with doing things that I love to do. There are going to be things I can't stand. I'm going to do them anyway. And then I'm going to reward myself. For me, when I've done something that I really don't like to do, and then I've, I've buckled down and I've done it, I say, you know what? I deserve a Starbucks. Now, I know not everyone has a Starbucks nearby them, and not everybody loves Starbucks as much as I do. But if I've done something that I can't stand, and I've gotten through it, and it's moved me towards where I need to go, I like to reward myself. And that moves me forward, still getting me doing what I can't stand doing, but I'm getting closer to completing my goals, and I'm being human. Second option that you might try is having people that you respect hold you accountable. Now, I could put the word respect bolded, capital letters. For example, many of us, when we have goals at work, we're accountable to our bosses. You may not necessarily like your boss. You may not even respect your boss. Having your boss hold you accountable is often a pain. It doesn't motivate you to do it anymore. It brings you back up to number one, those things that you hate, having to be accountable to your boss. Now, I use the word respect because it doesn't have to be the person whose vested interest is you completing the goal. You may have people on your team that you would go to the mat for in a heartbeat and they know it why not ask them to hold you accountable ask them to publicly hold you accountable i say publicly because too often if i have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone and they not so politely say sue you really need to get your acting gear i can ignore that I might be irritated at the moment when they're saying it, but I can shut it out once they've gone. I can ignore it. Oh, it was just so-and-so. But somebody that respect is really there. That's different. If I respect you and I've asked you if you would hold me accountable and you hold me accountable in public, you say in front of others, Sue, you said you were going to do this, and you didn't. I'm really disappointed in you. That's all my dad ever had to do. Just let me know in front of someone else he was disappointed, and I didn't do what I said I was going to do. That holds me accountable. I don't want to have that look from my dad. I don't want to have that public conversation with that person I respect. Just even knowing that that's a possibility keeps me moving forward towards completing my goal. If not having someone that you respect is working, why not reach into your pocket? Maybe money will be the motivator. There are people out there, we've got amazing life coaches in our district alone. Why not put some cool coin forward, ask them to be your coach and guide you and hold you accountable towards completing your goals. You'll pay them for it, which is something very foreign in Toastmasters. There are people out there that should be paid for what it is they're doing. Pay them to hold you accountable. Money going out of your pocket and you're still not doing what it is they're reminding you you want to do. Well, maybe you're independently wealthy. I know I'm not, and that would be something that would also get me moving towards accomplishing my goals. The third option that you might want to try 
not only having reminders of what it is that you do, but make them annoying. For example, in about five hours or so, I'll be getting up and getting ready to travel to Tampa for the mid-year training for the trio. I know, I can hear everybody. You're sad, I'm going to Tampa. I am so looking forward to this training. I'm looking forward to seeing my fellow district directors and other leaders. There's a bunch of people I know coming in from world headquarters. That's not enough to motivate me to get up at three in the morning. What do I have to do? I find the most annoying alarm I can possibly find on my phone. Yes, it is jolting to be woken up at three in the morning with this horrible sound, but it's effective. Ask yourself, what do you find really annoying? as a reminder. I'm not talking about, for some, having little pop-ups reminding you of what it is you want to do. Those are easy to ignore. I like to use my husband. I know. He, I can't necessarily use Tony for work or Toastmasters, but around the house, oh yeah. I say to Tony, you are free to annoy me to no end on the projects that I said that I wanted to do in the time that I said I want them. Do I find it annoying that he is reminding me yet again about what it is I wanted to do? Yes, but here's the key. I know that annoying reminder is going to irritate me to no end. So I'm going to try and face ahead of time so that I don't have that annoying reminder. The more annoying it is to you, the more you'll do the action that moves you towards your goal without the reminder coming along. And the last option I'm thinking of talking about here is Sometimes the goal that we want to accomplish needs to be more miserable not getting done than getting done. For example, I don't know about you, but many goals that I have that I look back that I didn't accomplish, there wasn't really any downside. Yes, I wanted them, I'm going to admit, Yes, those are goals that I have parked for the future, but my life didn't overly change because I didn't accomplish those goals. However, what if not accomplishing the goal makes your life miserable? Mm, maybe then you'll think about accomplishing and moving towards that goal. My husband, Tony, had a classic example. For you smokers out there, you will totally relate. Tony has been trying to quit smoking for years. His mother was always after me. Sue, get him to stop smoking. I said, I'm not his mother. I can't motivate him. This is something personal. It's got to come from him. We would go to California on our yearly trip. You can't smoke anywhere, even outside now in California. We'd be away for three weeks. He wouldn't smoke at all. Come home. I was really proud of him. I would hear 30 seconds after we got home, the garage door would open. And I knew I couldn't believe it. Back out into the garage. Tony was having a cigarette. I just figured he was going to be a smoker to the ends of his days. Until finally one day, he came to me and he said, I've quit. 
I haven't smoked in a week. I said, get out. I wasn't, well, okay. I wasn't that excited. I'd had three weeks of him not smoking in California. I said, why is this going to be any different than California, Tony? He said, here's what I've done. When he would go out for a smoke, he bought the worst tasting tobacco that he could find. He would get rolling papers and he wouldn't pre-roll cigarettes. He would roll a cigarette when he wanted a cigarette. When he would smoke the cigarette, he said, even when I was smoking it, it was the worst taste ever. I couldn't believe I was still smoking it. Slowly but surely, Tony weighed, do I want to continue smoking this awful tobacco that I really can't stand or do I want to quit? And he quit. And I'm happy to say he hasn't smoked in three years. He recently went to see his doctor. His doctor asked him out of curiosity, how did you quit smoking? And Tony explained it to her. She said, you know, I'm going to write that down and share that with others. That's absolutely brilliant. Whether it's brilliant or not, whether it works for someone else or not, the point was that Tony was more miserable smoking than not smoking. And that got him to stop. It also got me thinking at work. I remember when I went into a new job and we had had this huge audit from the National Archives. They told me that there was a follow-up audit coming at the end of the year, eight months away. No one had really done much in the way of improving on what it was we were to do. I pulled the team in and said, you know, the activities that they say that we should be doing, there's no question there's a lot of work, but I can't imagine what it's going to be like around here when our boss realizes that the archives is coming in for a follow-up and we've done absolutely nothing. The looks on their faces, it showed me right away their preference was to do the work they really didn't want to do as opposed to suffer the consequences of what it meant to not do it. I'm happy to say that we worked very hard in those eight months, but the archives held us up as a model once they went through the follow-up audit. So sometimes being miserable can be the motivator for us to get something done. Not that I'm saying that any of us are insane, but if you continue to do your plans and set your SMART goals and try and have everything measured and it's just not working, Albert Einstein would say, why are you doing the same thing over and over again without getting the same result? It, it doesn't make sense. And to me, it may not necessarily be insanity, but maybe it is time to try something a little different than what you've been doing in the past. The other thing that I want to really reinforce with people is sometimes we don't achieve our goals and it can be heartbreaking. I know I've run for second vice president of Toastmasters twice now and haven't made it. And deep down, that still is a goal that mm, got away. We have to keep trying. Why? Because sometimes just repeating what we did, even though we didn't do it, that in itself is rewarding. You may not necessarily achieve what it is you're doing, but just doing it and trying it again is sometimes its own reward. I look back in campaigns that I've lost, 
goals that I haven't accomplished, things I've wanted to do but never did. But I did some of it. And it's worth trying again, I say to myself. Also, circumstances change. We maybe didn't achieve something because it just wasn't the right time. So we'll try again. Or sometimes, for perfectionists, of which I am not one, sometimes you've got that bar so high, maybe it's time to just lower the expectations, lower that bar, and try again. One of the key reasons for continuing with the goals that you haven't yet achieved is maybe it's something you really, really need to do. Maybe you lost a position, but we need you back. Maybe you tried to stop smoking and didn't, but we want you in our life healthy. Maybe it's time to do it again. Maybe you really do need to try. And the last is something that Toastmasters teaches us every single time we step up to a podium. Practice, practice, practice. Following through on things we don't like to do, that's difficult. But if we keep practicing and trying it and trying it again, and trying it again, maybe this time we will achieve the goals that we want to do. Sometimes planning, setting ourselves up with smart goals, having a path from A to Z gets us to where we need to go. But sometimes it doesn't. Rather than giving up on the goal, kicking ourselves, thinking we need to motivate ourselves in some other way, maybe it's just time that we embrace the, the weaknesses that we have in ourselves and just use them to our advantage and see if any of them will help us move closer to those far away elusive goals we still have. Do any of you have any questions on any aspect of goal keeping, goal setting for you? Anything that I can help you with or perhaps someone on the call might be able to help you with? I'm ready to take those questions now. Oh. I'm really going to miss chocolate soup. I beg your pardon. Is that being edited out? <laughs> For the punishment, I'm really going to miss chocolate. And yes, Craig, you can edit it out. <laughs> Does anyone have any specific goals that they had challenges with and then doing something different than what they had done previously resulted in success? I have one, Sue. Well, I joined in 1994, and I had not achieved my distinguished Toastmaster level. And I would have said at the time that it just wasn't that important to me. Uh, learning was, and getting a credential wasn't. And then Pathways showed up and said, by the way, if you, if you don't complete your uh, award by July of 2020, it's gone and you have to start over. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I thought about it and said, maybe it's time to light a fire and poop. I love it. I love it. Good so, for you, Craig. So even though I'm, I'm not particularly credential driven, but capability driven, having a goal crystallized my behaviors to get it done. You know, you achieving your distinguished Toastmaster reminds me that we often forget that when someone else has a goal, it means something to us too. When you 
are recognized in the spring, my friend, for achieving that distinguished Toastmaster, get ready for the applause. <laughs> Sue, mm -hmm. I love the idea of uh, the goal setting and making it painful, for lack of a better word, uh, as a motivator. It's, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to implement it within a, within a team environment. And obviously it will be up to them to determine what their pain will be. Uh, but I find that interesting. I'm trying to think it through. Well, you know, the, the fabulous thing, Sylvain, is that it's very personal. What bothers someone? For instance, I know people who are, they love being micromanagers. Having to follow up with other people would be their dream job. Catching people in not achieving what they were supposed to do on time, love it. For me, I can't stand it. So each individual on a team has certain things that really bother them. And if you can tap in, not so much to find out what bothers them and then exploit it, but to find out what bothers them and and use it to the advantage. Make sure that we are moving forward and each time we slack off, remind the person what it is that makes them really feel lousy. Remind them that this is something we don't want them to go through. Remind them that it's much better to feel that pain and move it, move forward, move through it. Because eventually once you're there, now I don't know about this for women who've gone through childbirth. I've heard childbirth is the worst possible pain, but there are women who continue to have children. They <laughs> fight through that pain. If they can fight through childbirth, I think we can tap into what bothers us and use it to move forward. Thank you. Not a question, just a little bit of a comment. I did a speech recently on misquotes. By the, Einstein never did say that about insanity. But the real quote, when I found the source, it says repeating the same mistakes over and over again is insanity. And that changes the meaning for me a lot. And I, I just gave a speech on that exact quote, by the way. So. Well, isn't that coincidental? The idea for me, and I don't consider any of us insane, the idea for me is that sometimes doing the same thing over and over again and expecting we're going to get some different result is pretty insane, whether it's Albert Einstein that said it or not. So thank well, you for that. Well, it goes along with the other quote I started my speech with. If, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. And then we have the misquote from Einstein, which it's misquoted often and misattributed because he never said it, which seems to contradict it. But when you get the real quote that says repeating the same mistake, so I need to understand what my mistakes are. And then I can, then I can try again. Thank you for that, Jim. And I'm not very good at it. <laughs> well, I'm not a perfectionist, so I have repeated many, many mistakes, many, many times. Any other questions or comments? I was involved with a team one time and we would hold a team status meeting every week. And I noticed that against some of the activities, the, the status would be, well, well, that's ongoing. <laughs> and after a couple of weeks, I started to clue in and I said, what do you mean ongoing? <laughs> what has actually been done? Well, it's, it's ongoing, you know. Nothing was actually happening. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Craig. When, when you were in that team meeting, were you the team leader or were you a fellow team member? I don't recall. I might have been a, a colleague in another team. You know, I have found that when you have a colleague call you out in a team meeting, 
that carries a lot more weight <laughs> than the boss. The boss you can commiserate with others. Oh, you know, that's the boss. That's the way they are. When a colleague or a team member points it out, ooh, that one stings. That one resonates. Doesn't happen very often, unfortunately. Or they'll have sidebar conversations about it, but never with the individual who needs to hear it, or rarely. Uh, for me, you're a role model. Can you share what is you, your uh, secret of making goals every year? And I know you for many years, and every year I see you setting so many goals. So what is your driver? Well, France, it's, it's quite simple. If I don't set goals at the beginning of the year, I have too many things I'm interested in doing. It's not that I don't have a short attention span. It's just I love learning and there's so many activities out there that I could learn about. I find I focus myself at the beginning of each year and say as much as I would like to do so many things, I, in Toastmasters, for example, I have goals for each of my clubs. And then what that allows me to do is when I sign up for meeting roles, speeches, I know they're counting. That for me is something that I'm going to miss. That competent leader manual, I know that many people don't enjoy the competent leader manual for me. Not getting feedback on a role that I've taken in a meeting through my competent leader manual is going to be the biggest change for me when we hit July 1st, 2020. I'm so used to it, but I'm, I just need to be focused because if I don't create my goals at the beginning of the year, there will be distractions throughout the year. I will go off on tangents and I will feel great. I'll be learning. But in the end, I'll look back and I'll say, did I really accomplish anything for my clubs? And the reason I do that for each of my clubs is because I'm grateful for my clubs. And I was taught at the very, very early on that if we as members don't deliver on goals, we don't take on club officer positions, we don't bring in guests, and our club folds, then I don't have that wonderful place anymore to go that has been so enriching for me. So to me, it's quite simple why I need to set my goals and why I do them early and often. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome, France. Frans, I want to just, if we have a bit of time, I want to mention for you, I mean, I've had you as a leader. You're very goals focused. You are very motivated. I'm curious, what keeps you moving forward? What do you do when you've got a goal that is being put to the sideline? What what is it for you that gets you back into the ring? Well, for me, especially in Toastmaster, this brings me back to my youth when I was going to school. When I started the year, we had some goal. We had to graduate. We had to finish courses. And I finished at the end of June. So my Toastmaster is the same thing. July 1st, I start something. I start brand new. And I finish in June. And it's the end of it. And every year is a new year. And I love it. Yeah. So it's like a yeah. chapter, it's a new chapter every year. This is what drives me. Actually, that's a good point. You can see an ending, even though Toastmasters continues, you can see an ending and you just work towards that timing. That's, that's, a, good, that's a good practice. Any other final questions? Well, thank you, Sue. My pleasure. Bye. Have a Thank great you day. all. Thank you. Thank Take you. good care. Thank Bye. you, Greg.